Coming to you live from our broadcast studio here at the WeWork building in Sampton, Johannesburg. Welcome to the South African launch of the magnificent book series, Remembering Wildlife. My name is Boo Prince. I'll be your host for the next hour as we explore the extraordinary world of some of the most iconic creatures on our beautiful planet and the fate that they are facing and the role that each of us can play in preserving not only their habitats, but the animals themselves. I'd like to introduce you to an absolutely extraordinary lady who has dedicated her life to conservation and using this magnificent series of books, the Remembering Wildlife series, to not only raise awareness, but also to raise incredible funds that then get donated to conservation causes. I would like to introduce you to Margot Raggett. Margot, thank you so much for joining us. And Hi. I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you because of course, this has turned into your life's work, this Remembering Wildlife series. Can you give us just a touch of insight into your life before you became a conservationist? Because it, I mean, it's been a radical change in your life. Sure, um, yeah, nice to, nice to see you. Thank you for hosting this for us, Boo. Um, Yes, I, I was nothing to do with wildlife or conservation. I lived and worked in London for 20 years, um, running a big PR agency here and um, started traveling on safari and then started trying to build a world in, in wildlife photography um, uh, about 10 years ago. But it was six years ago that I actually saw a, a poached elephant um, and that, that changed everything for me. Um, I was so shocked at... Um, the, the sight and the smell um, of this poor elephant um, and that still had a poison arrow in him um, that I, I just thought I have to do something about this poaching crisis. And I, I thought, I don't think enough people, particularly outside of Africa, really understand quite how bad it is and, and you know, what, what can I do to help? So Margot, I mean, most people don't actually have that kind of extraordinarily visceral experience, but equally, Anybody who does choose to support a conservation cause or, or devote some of their life's work to conservation, they seldom make as radical a change as you have done. And I mean, you've jumped in boots and all. How did you conceptualize this remarkable Remembering Wildlife series? Well, I'd, I'd love to claim it was a, a well thought out long term strategy, but um, it, it, it's evolved as we've gone through. So to start with, I just thought, I want to raise awareness of elephant poaching and maybe I can do an exhibition, maybe I can do a book, maybe I can do both. Um, so I, I spent a few months kind of deliberating as to what to do and, and concluded that a book was a good thing to do. Um, and then I thought, well, actually, I want to try and get as many photographers as I can to, to contribute to this book, because certainly I don't have um, you know, the, enough pictures that would, would be a best selling book. But I knew if I could get everyone together um, and the, the quality of the photographers, as you'll, you'll get to experience with some of the guys you're going to meet tonight, um, if they all work with me, then um, you know, we'll have something quite special. So. Um, I started in those early days just reaching out to anyone I knew. So actually one of the very first people I, I uh, got in touch with was Daryl, who I'd randomly been on a plane with um, from Samburu to the Mara, I think. And I, I just recognized what he looked like and went up to him very shyly and said, are you Daryl? Um, and he was lovely and we had a, a chat. So then I knew he was nice. So when we started this, he was one of the first people that I spoke to. But um, it just kind of evolved. And when we got to the point that Remembering Elephants launched, um, I wasn't sure how successful it would be or how popular. And, and people just loved the idea. They embraced it. Um, everyone wanted to be involved. Everyone was offering to help. And, and then everyone started saying, well, you've got to do another one. Um, and I really, at that point, was thinking, do I? I just, this was a year of my life doing this book. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do more than one. But um, I then actually spent some time with um, a northern white rhino that the last male northern white rhino called Sudan up in El Pegeta. Um, uh, he's subsequently passed away, no longer with us, sadly. But um, seeing him just made me realize again that, um, you know, rhinos were also in trouble and, and they deserved a book, too. Um, and it, we've been <laughs> we've been going ever since. 
Now, Margot, we, we are going to be speaking to Daryl Balfour in just a moment. I do want to mention to you, Margot, that there's no such thing as a random meeting, right? You think <laughs> it's a random meeting, but it's somehow written in the stars um, right. that, that you guys should meet and collaborate on this extraordinary series of books. And if my understanding is correct, Daryl has contributed to more than just the elephant books yeah. um, in the Remembering Wildlife series. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, I think Daryl's actually contributed to every single book um, and, yeah, been an enormous supporter. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes I get kind of a bit down and I think, oh, is this achieving anything or are people still keen? And, and Daryl always, as do all the guys on this call, rally me along. So um, I'm very grateful to his and, and everyone's support. Now, Margot, uh, your uh, mission in this is not just to raise awareness, so not just to sell books but in fact to sell those books with the purpose of raising funds to donate to conservation. Can you put a figure on that? How, how successful has that been up until this point? Yeah, I, I think actually we wrote it in the, the write-up for um, this broadcast in Rand, because I can't remember, but it's over 800,000 US dollars. Yeah, I do know because it's okay. a staggering sum. <laughs> but in fact, um, my notes tell me that you have donated in excess of 13 and a half million rand to conservation, which is simply extraordinary. And of course, there are going to be so many people watching tonight who are inspired by this and who would love to purchase these books. But they're also going to be asking themselves, well, how do you select which organizations you donate the money to? Sure. Again, that's been a, a, an evolutionary process. So um, I started in the early few books. I, I partnered with the Born Free Foundation in the UK, who um, I had been supported, supporting with images of my own um, for a while. Um, and they were a great partner to begin with because they were able to give me advice on the projects that they already had identified and supported. But as time has gone on, I wanted more independence and, and more freedom to choose the, the projects that um, meant the most to me. So quite often they're recommended to me by people that, um, you know, are involved in the project. So um, various photographers, including Daryl, has um, uh, you know, suggested we just uh, supported the Nyasa Lion project, um, which is one that is very close to Daryl's heart. And, and he had recommended that to me. So. Jonathan and Angela Scott have been enormous mentors to me and worked in conservation forever. So they often put forward organizations such as the Teacher Conservation Fund, who uh, we're going to be supporting with this year's um, forthcoming Remembering Cheetahs, which isn't out yet, but um, will be in, in the autumn. Um, so, uh, and then I do my due diligence as well. So, you know, I, I check up a lot of them, I ask around, um, and I do go and try and visit projects. Um, it's not easy um, as I'm based in the UK, but I try and get out every um, a couple of times a year to visit projects. So I was just in Namibia now visiting a couple of cheetah projects to make sure that I felt that their, their work is something we wanted to support. Okay, and, and we are going to discuss um, towards the end of this broadcast a little bit more about the Remembering Cheetahs book. That one is not out yet. However, tonight marks the launch of the Remembering Wildlife series being available in South Africa. And that means that you are now able to purchase one of these magnificent books. There is Remembering Elephants, Remembering Lions, Remembering Rhinos, and Remembering Great Apes. Without further ado, I would love to uh, introduce our audiences to some of these fantastic photographers who have so generously donated their work and given us an opportunity to really get some unique insights into the lives of these absolutely iconic animals. So let's start by meeting uh, Daryl Balfour. Now, Daryl, I, I mean, Daryl and I in many ways go way back because we've shared broadcasts and I've interviewed him and so on, but Daryl and I have never actually met face to face, which seems a crime after all these years. But Daryl is an absolutely legendary photographer and conservationist and has written many books of his own as well. And Daryl, you also work very closely with uh, your wife, Shana, is my, my understanding. You're both dedicated conservationists and photographers, and you also take lucky people all around the world to experience some of your photographic safaris. 
So welcome and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Boo. Good to see you face to face, if not meet you face to face. Exactly, exactly. Now, Daryl, yeah. tell us a little bit about your journey with elephants, because I know that you have been taking photographs of all kinds of iconic African animals, you know, as they say, since Pa fell off the bus. But it took you many, many years to capture this iconic sequence, which is in the Remembering Elephants book of a matriarch giving birth to a baby elephant. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Because it must have been extraordinary for you. Yeah, Boo, my, my journey with elephants began because I, I basically, I love working on foot. I like walking with animals and obviously elephants and, and rhinos are the best animals to walk with. So I've spent many, many years and hundreds, thousands of hours photographing elephants. And the one thing that always eluded me was a birth. Uh, Shana and I worked on our book on, on elephants, African elephants, a celebration of majesty for four years back in the early 90s. And the one thing we really, really wanted for that book was to photograph a birth. And unfortunately, that eluded us until I was on safari in the summer of 2010. Um, so the elephant book was early 90s. It was a long way through those 25 years of elephant photography, basically, before I happened to come across this elephant. One morning, there was a herd of them out in the plains in Mombo, Botswana. <coughs> and um, the herd was happily grazing. And I suddenly noticed one of the cars in the background behaving strangely. And I said to the guide who was driving us around, I said, hang on, there's something happening here. Let's just watch that car. And uh, sure enough, within minutes, I said to him, she's going to give birth. And the next thing, there it was happening right in front of us. Early summer, short green grass out in the open. And it was just an absolutely momentous occasion. And I had, I had clients with me had been on many, many safaris, and it was, it was really fantastic sharing it with them. But I, at the same time, I, re I really felt heart sick and heart sore that, that China wasn't with me because it was something we'd both always wanted to capture. And, you know, to, to capture that, uh, at any, any birth, I, I, I suppose, any birth is something special to watch, but, but to watch an elephant giving birth, and then see the the interaction, the whole herd gathering around, all helping, all trumpeting, and the the other calves in the herd sort of crawling through underneath the adults to get as close as they could to the newborn and reach out to their trunks and touch it. And then these other calves going down on on their knees and trying to help this little guy up to his feet. It, it was just so so amazing and so so moving. I love that story, Daryl. That is that is just incredible because, you know, aside from anything else, I think one of the things that is so profound for me about the bush is that it's always different. You know, I mean, just listening to your story, I think it brings home that one can be on safari, you can go on game drives, you can walk in the bush for years and years and years and every occasion will be different. And as long as you pay attention, oh. you're all, always going to see something new. And it, it brings home for me how extraordinarily important it is for us to be able to preserve wild places and wild creatures. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure every one of the guys who's going to be talking after me tonight will say the same thing, that no two days in, in the wilderness are ever the same. And I've been doing this professionally for more than three decades now. And I'm excited every single day I go out because I know that I'm gonna see something I haven't seen before more times than not. Daryl, just, just very, very briefly. I mean, one of the things that most people don't know about you is what, you are one of the few people in the world who has actually been trampled by an elephant and survived the encounter. And yet, 
you, you're not a person that holds a grudge against the elephant or otherwise. You are still wholeheartedly in love with these magnificent, iconic beasts and, uh, and still taking photographs of them whenever you can. Can you give us a little insight into that story? Because it is a cracker. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, it was back in December 1992. Sean and I were doing our book in, uh, on elephants in the Kruger Park. Uh, we did have permission to be out uh, walking um, by ourselves. And we've been looking for a particular elephant on a chalk one. It was one of the, the great tuskers of, of that era. And uh, this one morning in particular, I found him. It was the first time we went looking for him. and. Within an hour of setting off to look for him, we got some information as to where to look. Um, I spotted this big guy off in the felt. Uh, we walked out. Well, in fact, I walked out. Shana didn't accompany on the walk that morning. And uh, I walked out, and sure enough, it was Chok Wan. Uh, I started photographing him. Um, he made a series of mock charges, which I should have paid uh, more attention to, but. After he had done his mock charges, he wandered off and started feeding. And I made the, I can't quite say fatal, but almost fatal mistake of going back and, and just trying to get one more shot. And I think every photographer will identify with that one more shot feeling, just one more shot. And uh, I think Chokwan looked at me and said, I thought I'd already told you to get out of here. And he came and almost took me out. Wow. But yeah, I survived. You and, did. And it, thank, and it just, thank goodness. It just, deepened my, it just deepened my resolve to do something for elephants and, and deepened my passion for them. Thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you so much for sharing your, your experiences. And of course, you can see Daryl's magnificent work, not only with elephants, but Daryl has contributed photos to every single book in the Remembering Wildlife series. And so you can see his work in those books. We're going to be moving on to our next photographer. Thank you so much, Daryl, for joining us. Johan Marer is an extraordinary photographer in his own right, but he is also a wildlife vet. And he is also the founder of saving the survivors. He donated an incredibly rare picture of a Sumatran rhino from Malaysian Borneo to remembering rhinos. Welcome, Johan, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Good evening, Boo, and good evening to all the viewers. You know, thank you very much for having me. Now, Johan, tell me the story about this incredible photo that everyone can see. It is, it is absolutely astonishing. And of course, these are not African rhinos. These are not rhinos that we know from the South African bush. Yeah, exactly, Boo. So I think we were, um, you know, very fortunate and very blessed. About three years ago, we got a call from a Malaysian Borno to say uh, there's a very sick uh, female Sumatran rhino in that area. At the time, there was only about three rhino in that specific um, uh, you know, area that was taken out of the wild, and they were trying to breed from these rhino. Uh, and this one female called Puntung was really, really sick, and she had this huge growth on the left side of her face. So um, when we got the call, we immediately you know made plans and we flew to this area um and we went to look at her unfortunately in the end it uh it turned out to be a really bad cancer of the upper jaw and eventually uh, she had to be put down however uh, the uh, the other female that was there um was completely um you know fine and you know she was doing well but then this male was um was the only male that was there and she and he was also doing really well and on one afternoon we actually went into the rainforest to photograph him and he was called kartam um and it was an amazing experience to actually go into that rainforest and to 
and to be able to be um, in the near vicinity of him uh, and to be able to take these photographs of these amazingly rare, you know, Sumatran rhino. Currently, there's only about less than 30, uh, you know, less than 80 of them um, in the world. If we talk about, you know, black rhino, there's about 4,500 left. If we mm. talk about white rhino, there's about between 12 and 15,000 left. And if you talk about these, um, you know, this amazing species, there's only less than 80 of them left in the entire world. So it was an incredible experience to get so close to him and to be able to take these photographs of him. Sadly, though, uh, last year he developed uh, really bad kidney and liver damage. And I think it was in May last year that he, he unfortunately also passed away. Wow. You know, I, I think sometimes for people who don't have the opportunity to get out into the bush and, and actually get really close to these animals, they may not completely understand that that sort of visceral emotional connection that you have with an animal when you get up close to it. And I can imagine that your emotions must be very, very intense when you are photographing a creature that you know your photos may be amongst the last photos ever taken of the species because they are facing extinction. I mean, when there's only 80 of you left in the world, your numbers are not looking absolutely. promising. Yeah, Bruno, absolutely. Uh, you know, I must say, you know, that probably ranks as one of my two top experiences, you know, ever uh, of, of the photographs, you know, that I've taken. To be able to come that close to a species of which you know there are only 60 to 80 in the wild um, left. And, and, and uh, you know, it's not easy to actually see them and to photograph them. Um, it was an incredibly uh, emotional experience, um, you know, to walk with them in the wild. And, you know, the other thing which makes them extremely special as well is they're very, very vocal. Uh, if you oh. compare them, for instance, to black rhino or even to our white rhino in South Africa, they are probably 60-70% uh, more vocal, you know, so they make this high-pitched sound all the time, you know, when they walk in the bush or, you know, when they're in the vicinity of each other. And, you know, just that, you know, to have experienced that was incredibly special. Now, you know, Johan, you know very well you're not getting away without making rhino sounds for me. Hey. <laughs> come, you know, on, a, come on. Let your you know, inner Sumatran very, rhino out. It's a very, very special, very high pitched sound. And, you know, people that have ever heard, you know, whales, uh, yeah. you know, the recordings, it sounds very, very similar. Um, it's a very high pitched sound. Um, which, you know, the first time you hear it, you go, no, you know, this is a two-ton or a one-and-a-half-ton animal. Surely they cannot make that sound. Um, but it's, it's very similar to whales. It's, you know, it's fascinating, this idea around vocalization, because, of course, in, in the average human being, we associate high-pitched noises with being small and young. And, yeah. you know, that's yeah, definitely yeah. not the case in, you know, with whales and surprise, surprise, who knew? Rhinos. Exactly. You, you know, um, I think the other, uh, you, uh, you know, the other time which I heard this incredible amount of a vocalization was in the Congo, where we visit a place called Zanga Zanga Bay, where there were about 120, 150 elephants. And it's probably the only place in the world which I have visited where I've heard that many vocalizations between elephants. I've never, ever heard it anywhere else. But, um, you know, to come back to, to the Sumatran rhino, um, it, was, it was really incredible. And, and to have the support from, you know, from Margot and from the remembering rhino uh, launch and you know the book series 
you know, really helped us, uh, you know, to support these Rhino and Rhino after that, you know, going forward with these incredible, um, you know, injuries that they still experience up to this day as a result of poaching, unfortunately. Well, that's actually exactly what I wanted to ask you about, Johan, because you're, you're not only a photographer and a brilliant photographer at that, but you're also a wildlife vet. And I know that you do significant work with rhinos that have been injured or damaged through the process of attempted poachings, for instance, because obviously if the poaching is successful, the rhino does actually die, which is too tragic for speech. Um, but your organization is saving the survivors. Tell me a little bit about the process of what you go through in terms of being able to rehabilitate some of those animals. Yeah, it's, you know, it's quite intense. Uh, so we started saving survivors in about 2012. Um, I say it's been running about eight years. And it was, it was basically started with the aim of looking after and caring for these badly injured rhino, uh, mostly white rhino, because there were so many of them at the time uh, that got poached. Uh, and the injuries we mainly dealt with were gunshot injuries. Um, and then the ones that were really intense and that are still intense and horrific is where they shoot an animal, mostly through the chest, which they survive, by the way, which is also incredible. But that shoot, you know, that shot actually stuns the animal. So they down for about five to ten minutes. And in that period, they chop off the horn. And, you know, often they use a chainsaw. And unfortunately, there's a belief in some of the people that the horn grows to below the skin surface. So what they do is they remove as much of the top part of the face as possible. So you get these rhino that are left with, with a third of their face being removed. Oh. And often they just miss, you know, the eyes um, when they do these hackings or they use chainsaws. So these are really, really large, large injuries. Um, you know, often they are about 40 centimeters by 60 centimeters big. Um, they roar, they go right into your paranasal sinuses. And the very first time I was called in the Eastern Cape to, to, to treat one of these rhino, they sent me um, you know, photos of it and I had a look at it and I went, there is just no way. There is no way that anyone can treat this, you know, this rhino successfully. Uh, the vet then phoned me and said, you know what, we're going to actually put her down. So if you come down and just try, at least we give her a chance, you know, which is very true. And I think with that we've done or we've been successful in quite a number of other injuries where you go well you know this rhino is probably going to die anyhow so what do we lose if we just try and save it mm. um and that first rhino was called hope and you know i think there's a lot of people that still know hope um where we a massive amount. yes exactly where where a massive amount of uh you know of of the dorsum of her face were removed and she taught us a massive amount of of what we can do what we can achieve and how we can actually heal these injuries unfortunately she died about two years later not because of the face injury but because of an intestinal in infection you know that they sometimes get um just after her death we actually got a bull called Saya that had a very similar injury um, and that, are, you know, he's still alive uh, and he's doing very well. Last year we, um, or, you know, just before last year, we put him to two cows and he actually sired a calf, which was born last wow. year called a Daniel. Um, and I think, uh, and I think that's the whole crux of, of, of trying to heal this rhino boo is to you know it's not for these animals to go back into a zoo or a cage and people to look at them and go oh shame you know you know let's see how they look or so on it's for 
for us to be able to give these animals a second lease of life on life and then for them to go back into the wild to be able to reproduce again and add to the you know survival of the species and i think we've been fairly successful this you know there's still a couple of things that we struggle with um, and challenges we had we have just because of the size of this animal and uh, and because you know the these are wild animals, but I think we've been very successful in the last eight years. And, and you know, and again, I must say, you know, thank you very much to Margot and her support, you know, towards saving survivors. Because I, I think it made a massive difference. Well, I, you know, Johan, thank you so much for the incredible work that you do. As as I say, not just as a photographer, but but your work through saving the survivors. It is absolutely extraordinary. And for anybody watching, if you have just joined us, welcome to the broadcast. Tonight we are celebrating the South African launch of an incredible series of books called Remembering Wildlife. And yes, we have just been talking about the horrors of poaching and so on, but I can assure you that the books are absolutely incredible. Magnificent photography from some of the world's finest photographers and also including photographs from many of our local South African photographers. We have such a, a, a profound talent pool in this country and people just spending a lot of time in the bush, on the ground and capturing some truly extraordinary moments. And of course, all of the profits from the sale of any of the Remembering Wildlife books goes directly back into conservation. So if you are somebody who cares a great deal about animals and about wild places, uh, like I do, one of the easiest ways that you can have an impact is to get your hands on one of these magnificent books and you will be supporting organizations like Johan Marais Saving the Survivors organization, which is partially funded by the proceeds of these books. And so even when, an, uh, as he was saying, even when a rhino has been gravely injured through an attempted poaching, they can still help the animal and they can, in many cases, rehabilitate them, which is absolutely extraordinary. Now, of course, one of the other creatures which is absolutely iconic is the mountain gorilla. Now, I was very fortunate in 2004 to spend some time in Rwanda uh, with the mountain gorillas, and it was really a life-changing experience is the only way that I can put it to you. Now, the Remembering Wildlife, um, Remembering Great Apes book in the series is one that celebrates all the great apes. So we're looking at chimpanzees, we're looking at mountain gorillas, woodland gorillas, as well as orangutans. And uh, this book is probably best characterized by the most extraordinary photo on the front cover. Now, that photo was taken by our next photographer who I'm going to introduce you to, and his name is Nielus Vormerans. Now, Nielus donated this extraordinary image that was used for the cover of Remembering Great Apes. And my understanding is that Nielus had a remarkable relationship with that particular gorilla on the cover of the book. Welcome, Nielus. It's wonderful to speak to you and wonderful to meet you. Thank you for being with us. Boo, thank you so much. And also welcome to all the viewers. Um, yeah, yeah, truly, truly remarkable uh, uh, animal, um, the silverback on the, on the front cover. So is, am, am I correct that his name was Muninya? That's correct, yeah. Tell me about your relationship with Muninya and what that meant to you and, and how it all started. Yeah, so, so you know, as you mentioned, the front cover of the book is, is a, a mountain gorilla silverback called Muninya, the dominant silverback of a family called Hirwa. Um, and it's probably one of the families that I've visited most in the time that I spent up in Rwanda. And um, I think, you know, one of the things besides his sheer size, you know, it's just, just a really intimidating size. I think one of the things mm. that, that really stood out for me about him it was his, his characteristic, you know, just such a gentle, gentle creature and, and, and really a gentle giant in every sense of the word. 
Um, so many of the tracks I've done up there, you would find Munini is sitting there surrounded by the youngsters. Incredible love for the, for, for the, for the little ones. And you could see it wasn't just, um, you know, like, uh, it, like that he felt like he had to protect the youngsters. Mm. He was, uh, he, he would love playing with them. You know, you constantly see him rolling around with them. Um, incredible to watch. So, you know, as far as characteristics that really stood out for me was his, his, his love for the family. A really, really great father. Now, Nielis, your stories about Munina just resonate so deeply with me because when I was fortunate enough to go and visit the mountain gorillas in, um, in Virunga in 2004, that was yeah. precisely my impression as well, was that um, I just remember lying in, in sort of this undergrowth area and watching this magnificent silverback and just being so struck by the fact that he wasn't actually kind of, you know, that, that stereotypical dominant kind of trying to assert himself over everyone around him the whole time at all. Yeah, exactly. He was a, a silverback that took great interest in the children. And I remember so clearly this particular silverback that I was watching, he picked up a twig that had a tiny little chameleon on it. And I thought to myself, oh, he's going to eat it. He's going to eat it. He's going to eat it. But he didn't. He just sat there with that twig, watching that chameleon for probably five minutes. And I just thought, you know, you can't help seeing them as almost human because they just do have that kind of curiosity and so many characteristics that really resonate with us as human beings. Have, can you tell me uh, any stories that particularly stayed with you about Moninia? Yeah, you, you, you know, besides being a really great father, I think he was also very trusting of, uh, of people. And, uh, you know, obviously something that had built up over the years. You know, Moninia um, originated from the Sousa family, which is one of the oldest uh, families in the Virungas. It was studied by Diane. And in, Moninia was a real, real ladies' man. And, um, you know, you always got into trouble with the dominant silverback of the Sousa family, Kurira, um, for cheating with the females. The females, you know, they, they're very promiscuous. And if they think number two or three silverback is better looking, they're going to cheat. And that didn't sit well with Kurira. So in 2002, uh, Muninia packed up and he disappeared for four years. And then um, I think it was 17th of June, 2006, he, six, he appeared. Um, on the other side of Volcanoes National Park, you know, close to the area uh, below uh, Sardinia Volcano with uh, several females. And um, yeah, and, 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 and that's where he started, uh, you know, the family that we know today. Um, yeah, interesting stories, like I said, very, very trusting. You know, on one of the tracks I did, um, halfway through our track with the gorillas, with the Munines family hero, it started bucketing down when we had really, really heavy rain. And I said to the, the, the lead uh, guide, I said to him, listen, um, it might be best if we just, um, you know, for the second half of the track, let's move away, let's find some cover, and then come back to the gorillas on the, uh, you know, for the, for the second half once the rain has, uh, you know, given us a bit of a break. And so we moved off well out of sight of the gorillas, and we found a lovely canopy under, uh, you know, one of the, the, the a thick canopy, and, and that's where we sat. And I promise you, we weren't sitting there for any longer than maybe five minutes. And the whole family, Monini in front, brought the whole family to come and join under that tree canopy. You know, there was nowhere for us to back off. And so we just sat, you know, took the guide's instructions. And I promise you, you literally couldn't you put your hand out in any direction um, without you know, touching a gorilla. So we all just sat there and we waited out the rain and there was just such an amazing way of uh, ending up uh, or ending our last half an hour with, uh, with that family. Wow, what a story. That is absolutely extraordinary. But now, Nielis, my understanding is that Muninia is sadly no longer with us. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened to him? Yeah, you, you know, um, Boo, it was towards the end of last year, Moninia took the family across um, from Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda, across into Mugohinga National Park on the Uganda side. Um, obviously, they don't need passports, so it's, a, it's a quick, an easy transition. And um, so, 
you know, unfortunately, it had devastating consequences. They were there for, I think, just over a month, maybe two months, and the family got struck by lightning, which, uh, you know, a, a number of the family members, you know, got killed in that lightning strike. And then um, before returning, I think, the, the you, you know, the trackers on the Mogahinda side, Uganda side, um, notified the guerrilla uh, vets that the guerrilla doctors, that Monini was um, having a respiratory uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, the guerrilla vets are a phenomenal worker. And they spent quite a bit of time going backwards and forward, monitoring him. And it sounded like his condition started improving at one stage. You know, they were with him pretty much through, through most of January. And then towards the end of January, it looked like the condition came back and, and, and it worsened. And uh, in, in, in February, yeah, he, he passed away from uh, respiratory uh, complications. Mm, big, big loss. But of course, <laughs> but of course he is mag his image is magnificently preserved on the cover. No, absolutely, the absolutely. I think, I think the book will definitely keep his memory alive. Mm. And Nellis, tell me, what, what has it meant for you to be part of the remembering wildlife journey? Because, I mean, these are not just kind of your average wildlife book. I mean, I, I know that Margot set out to create the best book about each of these iconic species, literally the best book ever created. Tell me a little bit about your experience with the remembering wildlife journey and what it's meant to you. Yeah, look, I can definitely echo that. So, you know, it's definitely, you know, one of the best quality books, one of books that I've ever come across. And, um, you know, when you spend so much time on the ground with, uh, you know, the people on the ground and the organizations that uh, look after the gorillas and, 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 and you know, do their best to, to um, keep alive and, and, and make sure they, um, you know, their numbers increase. Um, you see some of the struggles that, uh, that come about and, and to me, you know, the book has definitely, um, you know, helped so much. It has really not only uh, assisted with funding for a lot of these organizations, but also it has created much needed awareness uh, for, for the mountain gorillas and great apes in general. Fantastic. And of course, when we think of great apes in general and chimpanzees specifically, one cannot help thinking of the iconic Dame Jane Goodall. And of course, Jane Goodall lent her voice to the Remembering Wildlife series as well, because she in fact wrote the foreword to the Remembering Great Apes book. And I mean, I was very, very fortunate to spend some time with Jane Goodall at her home last year in Tanzania. And I can tell you that she is just as feisty and committed to uh, conserving wild places and iconic animals as she ever was, even back in the 60s, when she completely revolutionized our understanding of the great apes and our relationship to them in terms of how biologically similar we are to them. And also our understanding of these magnificent animals as having complex and just really emotional lives and societies and family connections and so on. So it's really amazing to see all these things represented in a book like Remembering Wildlife, so beautifully preserved. And as I said right in the beginning, and Nielis, you can talk a little bit more uh, about this as well, is that the great Remembering Great Apes book is not just about mountain gorillas or just about chimpanzees. It covers all the great apes. So there are some extraordinary pictures in there also of animals like the orangutans, for example. And Nielis, I'm sure it's been thrilling for you to be uh, you know, featured in a book alongside some of these extraordinary international photographers from around the world who've contributed such amazing images as well. Yeah, I know, uh, an absolute privilege and, uh, you know, it's really been an honor to, to uh, you know, showcase and especially um, Muninia, the, the, the solo back we're talking about, you know, having him on the front cover really, really meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, I've uh, unfortunately not, not yet had the privilege of meeting uh, Jane Goodall, but uh, yeah, never know, hopefully somewhere along the line. I can tell you, Nielis, she knows your work. <laughs> <laughs> 
because there's no ways that she wrote the forward to the book and she hasn't paid you know a lot of attention to the cover so yeah she knows your work <laughs> Nielis, thank you so much for being with us. That's wildlife photographer Nielis Volmerans, who contributed the magnificent picture of Muninia, the beautiful silverback gorilla on the cover of Remembering Great Apes. Now, we are going to introduce you to another fantastic photographer, and this time we're going to be talking about the king of the jungle. In the Remembering Wildlife series, of course, we have Remembering Great Apes, Remembering Elephants, Remembering Rhinos, and Remembering Lions. And the uh, photographer I would like to introduce you to right now is Marlon de Toy. And Marlon has a very special story to tell about a very special male lion by the name of Scar. Thank you so much for joining us, Marlon. I'm thrilled to meet you and very keen to hear all about your relationship with Scar. Thank you very much, uh, Vu. Thank you and good evening. Good evening to everybody watching as well. Um, you know, you, you come across animals. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, not quite as long as uh, the old man in the beginning or Daryl, but um, you know, I've been in the safari and the guiding industry for um, the last 15 years or so. And um, coming out of a lodge based guiding industry, I've, I've spent so much time with animals. You get to see, to see um, lion cubs turning to sub adults, turning to pride male lions. Um, and you know you get to follow the story of a lion um, from beginning to end, um, and you see them battle, you see them succeed, um, and it's just such an iconic animal that it's probably the number one thing somebody wants to see. And then you come across an animal like this, which um, you know to to um, to put in words. He, um, every encounter I ever had with this male lion was um, memorable. He, um, he would, he would. Um, how do I explain it? He, so, for example, when you came across him, you would so so few of the times he'd actually be mingling with the pride. So, for example, he was this loner, this bad guy. He had a certain look about him. And the first time I saw him was in 2012 in the Masai Mara in Kenya, which is where he he finds himself. And he just always had this um, this air about him, like untouchable, um, the 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 bad guy in the pride, and and um, but the ladies loved it. So whenever you saw him, he'd be off on his own, and and he'd get up and stretch and move around a bit, and and he'd walk up to a female, and he'd like just slap her, just like charge at her, and like, brr, like give her a hard time, and and somehow they would like it because I mean, who would? He's such a handsome male lion. He. He is the perfect advert for like a, a, a shampoo company or, or he's just perfect. Never do you see him and his mane isn't uh, you know, on form and he's always got a posture and he always, he never mingles with the normal lions. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying this and making this up. Many of the, the guys on here tonight have seen him and photographed him. Um, Scar just is a different lion in his attitude, the way he carries himself. And that resonates with every single person that meets him. And um, social media has turned this male lion into the most famous lion in Africa. Probably, dare I say, the most famous animal in Africa out of all the individuals around. He just, he is so recognizable. Um, I mean, there was a rumor of a, of a lion called Scar that, that died a, a couple of months ago. And um, the internet went like viral with, is Scar dead? And everyone was asking in DMs and messages. That's the effect this lion has had. And it wasn't him. It, I think it was a lion in Botswana. But still, the moment the news came out, it was like breaking news. And I have not come across an animal with that much influence um, and just appeal. And being able to photograph him and feature him in the book is really special. So, so Marlon, what I really love about what you're saying is that I think that when you... I do spend a lot of time in the bush and particularly as a photographer because you become effectively an animal ethologist and you have to be able to um, anticipate and understand so much of their behavior you really start to appreciate the unique individual personalities of each different character 
And you get to realize that actually a lion is not just a lion is a lion is a lion, right? Each one has their own character and their own personality and their own style and their own walk and their own look. And I just love your description of Scar as being that kind of ultimate bad boy lion, you know? I mean, aside from, aside from the fact that obviously he shares a name with the bad boy lion from the Lion King, um, there's just kind of that, that recognition of these unique characteristics of every personality out there in the bush. We as humans think we're so special. We're not so special. Everyone's got a personality. Absolutely. Um, and I think we, we love that. We, you know, it's human nature to want to assign that human attribute. A lion that, that sadly got killed was a lion called Cecil from Zimbabwe. Had Cecil not had a name, um, that story perhaps wouldn't have had such a profound impact. And the same with Scar. He's recognizable. He carries the you know that franchise from the Lion King and that bad character with him wherever he goes. And I mean, if you look at an animal like that, that is the way he looks there. That's what he always looks like. He is so photogenic. Um, and he's the perfect ambassador for a species like the lion, as iconic as what they are. He, he carries their spirit, their name, um, everything a lion embodies. He, um, you know, he has all those attributes. Um, and you know, in a world like today where a book like this has to carry the weight of the story of a lion and the conservation behind him, I think an animal like that is just the, uh, you know, the perfect specimen. I'm so grateful to... Um, I've been able to feature that image in this book with Margot and um, being able to share a lion like that. You know, I've, I literally, um, I have a tattoo of him. I, I have a few tattoos oh, wow. and I'll show you. So that is literally a, um, a tattoo so of that exact same. <laughs> I've got to that's, look down um, here to see it. No, 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 stand up again. Stand up again. <laughs> we, we need you to there flash you a little bit longer. Oh, wow. So That's it's, amazing. Um, it's the, and, uh, and, and Marlon, it's you the didn't go small. Thing, uh, okay? Your commitment to, to putting Scar on your body was real, it was deep. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And I've always wanted a lion. And, and I've, I have a few tattoos, but it takes a long time. And, and I just had to have a, 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 a tattoo that, that has uh, weight and, and personal meaning. And you know, nothing's better than Scar. He, uh, you know, if you think of his attitude, in life and how he's still alive that i think he's about a pride male he still has females he still mates like how is it possible that a male lion at the age of probably 14 um or going on 14 it's unheard of you know male lions by the time they're 10 they're yeah. done it's a tough life and he's still around you know he's i think he's with a second coalition um he's you know he's like the rolling stones he just he just hangs out with the young people and he just he just somehow makes it how he's how he's still around and still alive every year that we go to the mara and i see him i'm like that's goodbye scott has been great i probably won't see you in 10 months time and i said that in like 2015 and uh, you know he's still there how he does it he's just a, a remarkable animal Wow, that must be a deeply emotional experience every time you see him. How extraordinary. Yeah, and we're a few months away. Hopefully we can make it out to the Mara this year. We've got some plans and uh, to uh, get to see that guy again and um, to share his story. Now, now, Marlon, there are a lot of lion books out there. What does it mean to you to be involved and featured in this particular book, Remembering Lions, because it is such an iconic book and such a different book in so many ways. It is, absolutely, Boo. Um, and I'm fortunate to have featured in, um, in quite a number of the books, um, apart from The Great Ape, sadly, and um, I just haven't photographed them at that point. But this one in particular, you know, lions are, they icons, they are, Animals that are, if you talk about conservation, if you talk about history, um, if you talk about symbols of power and strength, um, very little can compare to a lion. It, they, it's an animal that's, that easily carries a conservation um, message. And I think to, you know, to be involved in that, to be able to share, I think I had a couple of images in this book, was a massive privilege. 
um, I've known Margo for some time, and and you know, just every time getting an invite to be a, a, to be able to be a part of it is special. And um, you know, you got to ask yourself, how do I give back? And I think that's the biggest thing for me, and the biggest um, motivating factor for me is how do I give back as a wildlife photographer? How do I make the photographs that I take um, count something for that animal? And I'm very active on social media and. Um, and and voice my you know concerns and, and conservation message as often as I can. But having an opportunity like this to the scale and the extent that it that it has gone, you know, 13, 14 million rand raised, um, to be a part of that and to know that the work that you capture um, can make an actual change to animals, to to the the teams that protect these animals on the ground. I think that for me has been the biggest thing and why. You know, it's an absolute joy to be a part of these books, and especially a book as iconic as uh, as Remembering Lions. So, you know, it's it's books that make a change. It's not money that goes into into the air. It's money that goes onto the ground, and these animals are actually seeing the difference. Marlon, thank you so much for joining us. I've loved talk, talking to you, and I love that you could show us your tat and introduce us to a little bit of Scar's life, and hopefully you'll be able to get back to the Mara this year. And won't you send Scar all our love, please? I absolutely will. Thank you. Thank you, Boo, for Thank the opportunity. You. Thank you. Okay, well, the Remembering Wildlife series of books, which, as I mentioned previously, uh, includes Remembering Elephants, Remembering Rhinos, Remembering Lions, and Remembering Great Apes, is now available in South Africa for the first time from today. You will also be able to pre-order uh, Remembering Beach, which is the brand new um, book in this fantastic series, and it will be coming out in October. I'd like to cross back to Margot Raggett just for the end of our broadcast now, because Margot is, of course, the founder of Remembering Wildlife and the person who had this remarkable inspiration to start the series of iconic books. Margot, can you give us a little bit of insight into what you from remembering cheetahs? Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thanks to all the guys for being on this broadcast. Um, it's been um, really emotional for me, actually, hearing all their stories. And I'm so moved at the support that we get from the photographers. Without them believing and trusting um, in me, we'd have nothing. So um, thank you guys, all of you, for being here tonight. Um, yeah, remembering cheetahs, uh, we're printing in four weeks' time. Um, so we're just uh, we're now proofing. Um, we uh, the book is complete, um, and all the images, high res, are in place. And we're we're going to have a digital proof in a couple of days. Um, so it's looking beautiful, I have to say. Um, I think maybe um, you know I, I'm a bit like a mother that the, their latest child is that happens to be the favourite, but I I really think Remembering Cheetahs has to be one of the most beautiful books we produce. So um, it's very exciting, but um, yeah, that's not out till October, so it's pre-orders now. But um, but in South Africa, it, we haven't had the other books available before now, so that you know to to be launching there today is um, a dream come true for me um, to to kind of you know go from just being UK based to internationally and there's been such demand from south africa obviously it's such a wildlife based place and so many wildlife lovers there that um you know that for years people have been asking how can they get the books there so i'm really excited that they they now can and margo you know remembering cheetahs has already drawn so much interest i mean i know that just a few weeks ago you were actually in namibia and you were spending time with Laurie Marker, who of course runs the Cheetah Conservation Foundation in Namibia. And she's doing extraordinary work with um, cheetahs and with the local community um, in helping them not be in conflict with the cheetahs, many of them and so on, with her incredible work. And I know that the two of you did a fabulous Facebook broadcast as well, an interview where you revealed uh, the competition winners um, from your Remembering Cheetahs photographic competition. And I'm sure that um, many people will, uh, you know, remember that broadcast and really enjoyed it, as did I, because it was a real eye-opener as well to learn about Laurie Marker's work with the Cheetahs and to know that 
your work in Remembering Cheetahs also goes to help fund the Cheetah Conservation Foundation. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, it's been a, uh, an amazing journey this last five years for me with this series, um, but my favourite moments are always when we're actually giving money to projects that I know are doing great work. Um, that that makes it all worthwhile for me. Sometimes I'm, you know, stuck on my computer in London thinking, what am I doing producing books? But um, when, when we get to give money to, to meaningful um, organisations, it makes a real difference. So, um, so yeah, with Laurie, we were able to actually um, spend time with the livestock guarding dog programme they have there, which is a brilliant idea. They, they get these dogs embedded, uh, they're specially bred, Anatolian shepherd dogs, um, and they're embedded with herds, um, with farmers from a very young age. I think it's about six weeks they embed them. Um, and these dogs just think of the herd as their family. And if anything comes along, I mean, we were there one day and a, a stranger came um, to the compound to ask for something. And the dog just went crazy and you don't want to mess with the, the sound of that dog so the cheetahs naturally will just run away if they hear the dogs and, and that prevents conflict so um that program has proved so successful that they've got a four-year waiting list for dogs so one of the things that we're going to be funding with remembering cheetahs um is actually trying to speed that program up for them and get more of these livestock guarding dogs out which um i'm very excited about well, that's just one of the incredible programs, thank you, Margot, that, that your remarkable project, Remembering Wildlife, this amazing series of books, that's just one of the projects that I know you support. And we've actually put together with HPH Publishing, who are your local South African distribution partner for the Remembering Wildlife series, they've put together a fantastic offer for local buyers and the idea is that you can currently purchase all four books which are currently available in South Africa from today. That's Remembering Rhinos, Remembering Elephants, Remembering Lions, and Remembering Great Apes. And you can purchase all four books today for the price of only three of those books. It's an absolutely incredible offer. And do remember that all pro profits from the sales of the books go directly into wildlife conservation. Margot, thank you so, so much for being with us. I don't know if you have any final messages that you would like to share with us. I've loved spending the last hour with you and these incredible photographers. And thank you so much for the amazing work that you are doing. Thank you. Um, no, well, thank you, Boo. Um, and also thank you to Heinrich of HBH Publishing for, for taking on distribution for us in South Africa, which is a real game changer for us for sure and um yeah i you know I, i'm always thanking so many people but you know i'd like to start with again thanking all the photographers because without them we'd have nothing and particularly um the guys who've been on this this call today i really appreciated it um and then yeah all of our supporters so we fund all our books through kickstarter campaigns um if we hadn't had that a successful campaign this year we wouldn't have had a book and I really wasn't sure we would given the, the COVID situation. So it's amazing to still have the support. So um, thank you to everyone who loyally supports our series and to all the South Africans thinking of buying these books. Hopefully we've convinced you that they're, they're beautiful um, and that you'll know that you'll make a real difference if you buy them. Thank you, Marco. And to all our viewers, thank you so much for joining us for the last hour. Uh, it is you who makes a difference in the world. And if you would like to purchase these books, please make your way to www.buyrememberingwildlife.co.za. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you again next time.